This last scene had 32 chums and one king released. Coming up on Frontiers, problem solving on the Yukon, catching chum salmon while saving endangered kings. Once a contradiction in terms. Caught in a rut, loose on the move, a complicated courtship comes September. Sponsorship for Frontiers with Rhonda McBride is provided by Kupik Corporation and Spinard Builder Supply. Alaska, where there are old triumphs, but also new frontiers. With challenges as great as the state itself, but a belief the best is yet to come. Bringing you the faces, the places, and the spirit of the last frontier. This is Frontiers with Rhonda McBride. Welcome to our program. This week we explore the economic frontiers of the lower Yukon River. Once the mighty king salmon was the money fish for the region as well as the heart of the subsistence culture. But since the 1990s, low returns have brought numerous restrictions and more recently, moratoriums on harvest. But there is some encouraging news to report this season. 83,000 kings, or Chinooks as they're also called, made it across the Canadian border to their spawning grounds, well above the goals of a treaty with Canada. Alaska has only met those escapement goals in three out of the last five years. But researchers say this season's numbers bode well for next year. And they're cautiously optimistic that this points to a rebound. But the run is still below average. Well, back in the 1980s, the overall Yukon River King returns were about 300,000 fish. Now, that's down to a little more than half of that. Traditionally, fishermen have used drift nets to catch salmon on the Yukon, which do a good job of snagging both the kings and the chums. That's why fishing had to come to a halt while the kings were in the river, even though the chums were in strong numbers. So fishermen had to let millions of pounds of chums swim by until they switched to dip nets and more recently beach seining, which allows the kings to be released alive. Left line, left line, left line. Although beach seining is common elsewhere in Alaska, the trick, how to make it work here. It's a different kind of fishing than what we're used to. But it's a fishing technique with promise. 28. 29. 30, 31. You can catch a lot of chums. This last scene had 32 chums and one king released. King right there. A king Patrick Tam sent on its way to its spawning grounds in fairly good condition. In fact, overall, beach sanding seems to be a kinder, gentler fishing technique. You get good quality fish. You don't see any markings, net markings on the fish. It helps that everyone here routinely works together because beach sanding takes a lot of teamwork. Go down, go down, go down. At first, the crew manually hauled in their nets, nets that are long and very heavy. It took about a dozen people to do that. The four-wheeler, though, helped them cut the job down to about four or five people. This is the first time I'm fishing like this, and it's fun, and I wish more people could try. The toughest part, releasing the kings. We all share this and this together. When we, when we let them go, we're thinking about our kids. And this is a family operation here. Patrick holds the king like a baby. I just kind of wish them well and I hope they reach the end of their life cycle and, and come back in, in you know, greater numbers. You know, that's, that's my hope. Hope, hard work, and the will to try. Well, there's one drawback to beach sanding on the Yukon. In years of high water, a lot of beaches and sandbars disappear. So uh, just to let you know, so there's no confusion, we did air this story last year as part of our series on the news, Season of Hope. And joining us now to talk about 
beach sailing and dip netting. We have Stanley Pete from Noonam Iqwa, which is a tiny village at the mouth of the Yukon, and Tiffany Aguiar, who is from Alakanuk, which is also on the lower Yukon. Well, Stanley, let's start with you. Uh, how was your beach seining experience different than, than what we just saw? Uh, my uh, beach seining comprised of uh, my wife and my two children. And how old are your kids? One is 16 and one is 14. So you grew up drift netting. How is beach seining different to you? It's been a, a learning experience for myself and my family. And how so? Can you talk about some of the challenges? Um, some of the challenges are uh, the weather, uh, the tide, and uh, just uh, repetition of, of uh, grueling days, uh, four, six hours. Yeah, that would be very demanding, I would uh, think. Do you feel like it's it's good to have this alternative you know, since since the gill nets don't work in times when the kings are running? Well, it, it it's it, it enables me to stay home and fish instead of looking for outside employment outside of our region. So, did you save a lot of kings with this technique? Uh, I've released hundreds. Uh, I think every set I had a king. I released it unharmed. So, boy, those people up on the Yukon are probably pretty happy to, to hear that. And how about you, Tiffany? Uh, dip netting, it just seems like really hard work compared to the traditional drift netting. Yes, it is, especially when you're holding a dip net in the water, going forward a little for 4 to 12 hours going home and having swollen hands, barely able to grip anything, and then waking up and trying to enjoy your coffee when it's hard to hold your coffee cup. Well, I hear it's been described like push-ups. Yes. Doing push-ups. Imagine staying there for many minutes at a time. So but were you happy to have that opportunity to be able to use the dip nets? I enjoy it. It's better than just sitting there all most of the summer and watching the fish go by and wishing we could commercial fish. <laughs> <laughs> and, and bring some money home. Well, I want to mm -hmm. thank both of you, Stanley, Pete, and T Tiffany Aguiar from Alakanuk. Well, one of the biggest frontiers for rural Alaska is building an economy. For the lower Yukon, salmon are the best hope. Well, Sony ain't going to build a TV manufacturing plant here. They're not going to drill for oil here. This is all we got. Well, up next, we visit the Quick Pump plant in Imanuk and look at how it pumps millions into the region. At Spenard Builders Supply, we're thinking about color a little differently. Our Voice of Color touchscreens help you select just the right shade to bring your ideas to life and life to your ideas. Discover your perfect color. Find it at SBS. Interior and exterior paint, quality supplies, and unmatched expertise. Shop our inspired and exclusive Alaska Color Collection, named by fellow Alaskans, only at SBS. The Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium provides comprehensive health services for Alaska Native and American Indian people across our state. In addition to world-class care at the Alaska Native Medical Center, our work delivers health services for rural Alaska. From cutting-edge technology for the best care possible, to modern construction of clean water systems and health clinics, to health training and outreach that honors our culture, our vision is that Alaska Native people are the healthiest people in the world. We have a story, a story of 27 families that put 18 months of their lives into building a village, a home for themselves and their future. Our Inupat culture goes back thousands of years carried by a strong sense of community. Our relationship with our natural surroundings is at the heart of our culture. By investing in future generations through development that is balanced with the love of our land, the Gupi Corporation brings together traditions of the past with visions of the future. We're in Ruby, and it was uh, on the thermometer 22 below. So I go inside. 
And they say, wow, it's 22 below. And she says, well, that thermometer's off by six degrees, so it's about 28. The guy sitting next to her chimes in. He says, well, that's not quite accurate as well, too. He says, you got to take another seven degrees because you're up here. And so it's really about 35 below. And then someone else comes in and says, yeah, but then when you get the wind coming in, it's another 10 degrees. So he said, so really, a couple hundred yards away, you could be at 45 below. The mushers come in and they say, gee, my thermometer bottomed out at 65 below. So we went from 22 below to 65 below, like that. Community Development Quota Groups, or CDQs, have become economic engines for many of Alaska's coastal communities. One of the legacies of the late Senator Ted Stevens, whose legislation gave them shares of the Bering Sea fisheries. CDQs earn millions, which they invest in the communities that they serve. And that's the case for the Yukon Delta Fisheries Development Association, the CDQ group, which owns the Quick Pack fish plant in Imanic. mud, fish oil perfume, dissonance. Who are you? It looks like chaos, the constant movement, but there's a rhythm to it all, and Jack Schulteis is in his element. Come on, I'll show you. And they know this comes out of their check, all of it. Yeah. Fishing is a tough business. You check that. Especially in a place like Imonic, with the high cost of electricity, air freight that costs more than a dollar a pound to bring goods in, and fuel at more than six dollars a gallon. A losing proposition, so why bother to try? There isn't anything else. Sony ain't gonna build a TV manufacturing plant here. They're not gonna drill for oil here. This is all we got. The Ammonic plant lost nine million dollars last year. And if it weren't for subsidies from the CDQ program, it would go under. And gone with it, the millions it pays out for fish and jobs. You missed the spot. Sophie Ann Moore has two kids. And like a lot of the workers here, she's a single parent. Yeah, I'd like to further my education and move on out of here. And this is a good helping stepping stone. For just about everyone here, Quick Pack is a stepping stone out of poverty. Every one of these bikes belongs to a kid with a job. Kids like Jacob Kamaroff. Jacob has worked at Quick Pack since he was 14. Good morning, Monarch Fisheries. This is Jacob speaking. How may I help you? In the afternoon, he trains other kids to answer the phone, a job Jacob really likes. I wake up early for school now, I'm always on time. I try to stay organized. Jacob has impressed the admin office with his professionalism. Pardon? Can you repeat that? And the way he puts family first. Joe Mike started to work here last summer. He's 14 now. Before that, when he was too young to hold a job, he wanted one so badly he offered to work for free. They get motivated. They don't have to go to their parents and say, Ma, can I have a dollar? <laughs> it, it, it's really great for them. But truth be known, many of the kids here help support their families. Elders in Ammonic believe the youth employment program has cut down on vandalism. Quick Pack says it's noticed something else. And for whatever reason, the kids that are in this program We've not had any suicides of the participants in it, which we feel is a very positive sign. Honestly, I lost track after the fourth one. Maggie Isidore is from a village where there have been a lot of suicides. She says her job boxing frozen salmon has literally been a lifeline. When I'm not working, I think about all the people that I lost, and that hurts me a lot because some of them, I was pretty close to them. At 14, I lost my best friend to suicide. Maggie says she's not alone. Most of the kids she works with have had to grow up fast. I have a lot of dreams. My main dream right now is to give my daughter the things I wanted growing up. Her daughter needs lots right now, and Maggie says the $10 an hour she earns here at Quick Pack has made all the difference. You have to be creative to, to pull this off out here. This isn't a by the book situation at all. Because the bottom line here isn't about profit, but keeping hope alive. 
Now, this story also aired on the KTV News last, KTVA News last year. And joining us now to give us an update, Jack Schulteis, who is manager of the Quick Puck plant. You know, I was looking at those shots of Jacob Kamaroff, wondering if he was back again. Yeah, he worked <laughs> again for us. And, you know, every year, I think this is going on his uh, third year with us. And how many kids do you employ overall during the summers? Something over 200 kids, high school age kids. So let's take a look at some of the, the communities that are part of the CDQ group. Uh, you've got quite a number of them, six scattered across the Yukon. What kind of a footprint does the CDQ group have on this region? It, it has a huge economic footprint um, on, on the region. You know, we're the biggest uh, private employer um, in Western Alaska. Uh, the amount of of money um, towards wages, fish purchases, uh, the the number of companies we have to provide employment or you know employment opportunities. We had uh, not just for our own villages, but all the villages. We recruited people from 16 villages in Western Alaska came to work in Emonic this summer. So that's huge, especially in a region where there aren't many jobs. And one of the things I noticed, and, and we have some footage of, of the fish plant operations, is that that's really miserable work. You're cold and you're wet and everybody is always smiling. There, uh, the, you know, the, the, the people there, they, they embrace this company because it, it's all they have as far as employment opportunities. And you know, usually er early spring people start calling us to make sure we're coming back, to make sure there's going to be a job there. It's turned into, you know, a, a reliable source of income in a, in a region that there isn't anything else. You know, there's no other industry but fishing. Well, in 2013, the CDQ group lost about $9 million on, on this operation in Imanic. And so some people might say, well, okay, you know, you got the payroll in, but why not just cut checks to everybody from what the CDQ group earns out in the Bering Sea? And then you don't have to have a big operation. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, a lot of people have said that, but you know, it's, our, our mission is to provide economic development. That's what a CDQ company is classified as an economic development corporation. So, you know, we need to work with what we have in that region that makes sense and provides the most to the benefit of the residents. If you live in that village, you're part of this company, period. You know, so the only way to do that is to have you know, industries that people that live there can participate in through jobs or supplying fish. Well, let's look at some numbers on actually what the, what the CDQ group accomplishes in terms of the employment. 516 residents, uh, 2.4 million payroll, 2.9 million fish purchased. Scholarships, almost $300,000. That's pretty remarkable. Yeah, for a region that has 3,000 people in it, it it's a lot when you, you know, you consider what isn't there compared to what we do do, you know, and there, you know, we have the boat building company, we buy fur, we started that business up again. Um, you know, we have a construction company. Those things have all helped the residents to the benefit of the residents. That's what we're supposed to be doing. Well, when you talk about the subsidiaries, which you just mentioned, now, this is something that, that is like a spin-off of, of the fisheries plant. Yeah, it, you know, it started out, we, the fisheries plant was the base, base industry. And from there, we built off of, you know, we had a place to operate out of Emonic, which is more or less the hub of the lower Yukon transportation-wise. And, you know, we, we have a, a boat building company rather than buying boats from another, you know, manufacturer. We build them all there locally, and they, they build 30 to 40 boats a year. There's year-round jobs involved with that company. Um, it's all managed locally and all local workers. Um, and that money all stays in the community. It, it isn't paid to outside workers. And the, the same with our construction company. Um, 
you know, we started a construction company to do, you know, bid work, and we, we've been fortunate that we've been low bidder on a number of jobs in the region. And in turn, those, you know, good paying construction jobs went to local residents rather than outside workers, which usually a, another company from outside the region or outside the state brings their own workers in and there's very little benefit locally to the local workers. So we've been, you know, we started that company up. Um, so between fishing, construction business, boat building, you know, we also buy um, raw furs. We became oh, that's the, interesting. Yeah, we became the largest raw fur buyer in, uh, I think, three years in the state of Alaska. And why did you start that up? It was a it was a traditional um, it was a traditional economy at one time. The fur business was huge in Alaska, and the Lower Yukon has a really good reputation for the quality of its furs. But it kind of died off over the years. You know, the the, the fur buyers stopped going. Um, it, you know, it changed. The market changed. But um, still, it's a traditional form of, uh, you know, it's a traditional economy there. And the people took to it really well. Well, that's great to hear. And maybe we'll have to do a, a follow-up story on, on the fur business this winter. I, I look forward to that. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Jack Schulteis. All right. Well, we're going to change gears here from fish to moose. Tis the season for mating, a courtship with conflict and complications. I just want cremation. Cremation specialists in Alaska. Can I have a service before cremation? Our staff is committed to serving your needs. I just want something basic. The simpler, the better. Specializing in simple cremations. Whatever your reasons are for choosing cremation, call Cremation Society of Alaska, 277-2777, or in the Valley, 373-8627 and on the web at alaskacremation.com. It's not like people are gonna come up to you and tell you they're thinking about taking their life. They're feeling alone, they're feeling hopeless. They're feeling lost, unloved. Those who are suicidal feel alone. Let them know they're not. Ask how they're doing. Check in every day. I wish I would've called them one more time. You could save a life, no experience necessary. For support, go to StopSuicideAlaska.org. You can't get very far until you start doing something for somebody else. Lions Club. We serve our community through vision screening and donating eyeglasses to those in need. We serve by promoting fun, safe, and competitive youth activities statewide. Together, we serve by staging events like blood drives, food collections, and the Miners and Trappers Charity Ball. Lions Club is young and old, men and women, giving back to the communities they serve. Won't you join us? Call or visit our website to find out how. All my life I've been in the outdoors. I remember being a kid when I was 12 years old, studying water temperatures off New Zealand to see if that was gonna turn into a tropical storm, which will turn into a hurricane, and what way is the jet stream gonna push it out in the Pacific? Does that mean Southern California is gonna get monster waves? I was a windsurfer, and I had to study the weather when I was in my early 20s doing my windsurfing. And I realized I've been practicing this all my life, and finally I, did, I got smart, and I realized this is what you'll do. When it comes to taking pictures, Alaska is a target-rich environment. And in September, Powerline Pass is the place to be for wildlife photographers. KTVA photojournalist John Thane caught up with one out to capture the drama of the moose mating season. It's a big moose party, very fall. No hunters up here, so the moose don't run away and they're they're pretty tame. My name is Brad Bodie and I'm out here looking for moose. Well, I usually get a couple of small young ones in here or, or cows right around the parking lot, but you don't usually see bulls here. Oh, there's a bull chasing a cow right on the trail. 
This is a great day. Catch a couple in the parking lot. Oh, a little snow in your mouth. That's interesting. Eating snow. There's probably a bigger one in the bush. <laughs> it's always pretty nice when I come up here. Pick those days. We're gonna start to get the light, the sunlight streaming through this valley. So we gotta get on the other side of the moose so the light's behind us. Ah, we're gonna get a lot. There's two more moose over by the telephone posts over there. Hear them? I'll go across this bridge and then cut through the swamp a little bit and see if I can get over in that brush where that other moose is. It's a wonderful place to be. You have to watch the sunrise streaming down. Beautiful mountains. It's always very pretty. There's a small bull working along the edge over here. We might uh, get the dominant bull here to stand up. Uh-oh. He's thinking, he's getting up. He's getting up. Here he comes. Yeah, he's gonna definitely drive this young bull off. He is protecting his territory here and his cows. A lot of the ones around Anchorage are, let you get really close, but when they're protective like this one is, you definitely have to respect this. This is my annual Mousset. Well, that moose story is kind of a hard act to follow, but take a look at this guy captured on camera by Carrie Olier in Denali National Park. Carrie says that she's certain that this ram was posing for the camera. Thank you, Carrie. Right now, we are in search of Cuspuk or Atikluk photos to post online and to include in our show next week. This one is of students in Shack Tulik courtesy of Renee Nicholson, a Spinard cuspic maker, originally from Bethel. Thank you, Renee. And you can upload your cuspic photos on the frontier section of ktva.com. We value your contributions to our weekly conversation. It helps us appreciate the exciting frontiers that we share as Alaskans, photo by photo, story by story. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next week.